Hello, BookTube, and welcome to 1920, I mean, uh, 2023. Kind of wish it was 1923 in some ways, but uh, anyhow, I'm here uh, to do another video about Historathon. Um, I, I'm sort of trying to get back into doing videos, so I thought this would be a nice, easy way to slide in, just uh, give some um, possibilities for people if they were interested in following it. There is, uh, Historathon is a year-long celebration of history that was created by uh, Vin at Revenant Reads, uh, and there's a number of co-hosts, uh, which I'll list them all at the bottom. And uh, my uh, reading for the year uh, is going to be uh, centered on Africa. Uh, and that even includes uh, Egypt as well, because that is part of Africa. But uh, after we get, because it's it's split up in, Historathon is split up into four uh, distinct parts uh, by periods. Sort of prehistory up to 500 AD, the end of sort of uh, Rome in a sense. Uh, and then 500, uh, that's the first three months. Uh, so it's January, February, March. April, May, and June will be 500 to 1500. July, August, and September is 1500 to 1820. Um, and then October, November, and December is 1820 to the present. And I will be reading Africa, as I say, throughout there. But I, I will probably throw in a few other things because history is a big subject. And I hope um, the... Um, um, that Vin and the other uh, uh, co-hosts don't mind me doing this video as suggesting uh, other things that sort of can fit in with history. I've got a couple stacks here of books that I'd like to go through. Uh, first of all, I want to make a plug for another, I will be doing a separate video on this, uh, but another history reading event that's happening all year. Uh, that Mark Richardson, uh, and, and I'm part of, I am a co-host of that, and it's the Great Pirate Project. So why not? You can read uh, History of the Pirates, and this is a Dover reprint of their maritime collection, I think it is. Um, and it's the General History of Pirates, the Pirates by Daniel Defoe. Yes, Daniel Defoe, uh, the writer, Robinson Crusoe uh, et al., and this is this is a history. So, uh, but obviously this is not ancient. However, if you were interested in ancient pirates, you can find things. Uh, for instance, you could uh, read stuff about the Sea Peoples. Uh, you know, um, I th I, th I think uh, that would fit in uh, for that. Um, let's see. Let's just let's just go down a pile here. Um, then we get into other like social history and things like this, and there's some a few oddities in here. So uh, it, it, it like I'm hoping to just sort of give a uh, spark the imagination of what could be read rather than just the you know standard uh, history uh, texts. Uh, here's a history of post office pillar and wall boxes called the letter box. So that's exactly what it is by uh, Jean Young uh, Ferugia with a preface by Anthony uh, Wedgwood Ben. And it's a Centaur monograph, Centaur Press, Fontwell, Sussex, 1969. And it's exactly what it says. It's a history of the pillar box. And it's uh, quite well illustrated. There's a whole section in here. Um, like I say, the letterbox, as we know it today, has been manufactured in a variety of designs for over a century. This means that many specimens may already be accurately described as antique. Unfortunately, some of the earliest examples are in danger of disappearing before records can be established. Um, yeah, it says uh, the letterbox not only gives the most readable and fascinating account of the history of the letterbox, but with text and illustrations... Uh, enables the reader to identify the many designs from the mid-19th century and to date them with accuracy. Here is a book that will appeal to the amateur letterbox potter, uh, as well as the industrial archaeologist. So there you go. And just continuing down this one pile, 
Noise, A Human History of Sound and Listening. And it's a companion to the BBC radio series, which I think I've downloaded that. That may be on their archive. But there it is by David uh, Hendy. And that was published by... Uh, well, it's an imprint of Harper Collins. it says. Uh, CCC. Oh, maybe. Uh, and that was published in 2013. This is the first American edition. Uh, what if history had a soundtrack? What would it tell us about ourselves? Based on a 30-part BBC radio series and podcast, Noise explores the human dramas that have evolved around sound at various points in the last 100,000 years, allowing us to think in fresh ways about the meaning of our collective past. So, again, just a little oddball, but uh, quite interesting. And then back to sort of the uh, post office box. Here's a history of the Penny Post, 1680 to 1918. Jacket's a little tatty, but uh, it's by Frank Staff. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the study of postal history opens up wide possibilities and is relatively uh, in is a relatively new subject to capture the interest and in social historian as well as the philatelist. The Penny Post not only gives the historical background of a reform, but indicates the range of items that were obtainable by the keen collector, early date stamped envelopes, broadsheets and pamphlets, letter sales or letter scales and stamp boxes, personal correspondence and newspaper cartoons. And the book itself is illustrated with a remarkable collection of photographs and line drawings. So, yeah, so it's, it's well illustrated. Uh, but there's other histories of this type of thing. Uh, there's a couple others that I, uh, uh, the topics that I should have grabbed down, uh, but they were way up high. It was just a little difficult for me to get to them. Uh, I'll mention them now. Um, I have an interest in the history of roads. So, and especially in bridges. So we get uh, some architectural history there with the bridges and construction, uh, engineering. Uh, we got history of trains as well we could do. Uh, but also um, history of carriages, uh, horseless carriages, that is, uh, as well as, you know, the history of the motor be uh, mo uh, early um, motor car. And carriages uh, that were, you know, horse and buggy. Uh, there's there's lots of that. And I've got quite a, a few things, but they're just up a little too high. Uh, here we go. Another one that's, again, a little outside of things is Seeing Through Clothes by Anne Hollander. This is a bit of a art history uh, book, but it's looking at... Uh, well, I'll just read it here. It says, In this strikingly original book, Anne Hollander explores the rich and complex heritage of Western pictorial art as it, is re represented, uh, as it has represented the human image, image, clothed, partially clothed, draped, and nude. The civilized eye, she, she, she suggests, is always eager for human images and even more eager for styles in the human image. And we get our ideas about how we look and how we should look, not so much from each other, but from political or economic constraints or from notions of comfort and social correctness, as from the powerful and per pervasive um, aesthetic uh, ideal that is suggested in the human image as we know it. So, yeah, it's uh, a history of that. And... Uh, how uh, people's uh, reactions are to to what they see and how it's changed society, if if it has. So, and this is by just looking at the publisher. It's Viking Press. Uh, yeah, the Viking Press. Um, it's got three dates here. So, it first published in 1978, but it looks like there might be bits of it. Uh, Oh, yes, uh, there was chapters that appeared in uh, Georgia Review uh, in different form. So in 1975 and 1976. So there you go. Uh, sorry. Uh, 
Now, again, back to social history. Uh, and this one is the oldest profession, a history of prostitution. And this account uh, of the forms taken by prostitution between the era of ancient Greek civilization and modern times stresses the close connection, often carefully concealed, of the oldest profession in the world with everyday life uh, in all countries in all, at all periods. Each epoch answered in its own way to the question whether the practice of whoredom uh, should be regarded as a necessary evil or a noxious growth requiring elimination. And this is by Lujo Basser, Basserman, uh, Arthur Baker Limited, um, translated from the German by James Clue. Uh, we've got 1965 it was original in German, and 1967 was the translation. Again, a tattered jacket, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and here we go, uh, history of water in England. Uh, and it says, water, uh, water meadows and hot water bottles, spa, spas and canals, fishing rites and holy wells are all part of the English way of life, a way of life inconceivable without a water in abundance. This new edition of Water in England brings home to every reader how much we take water for granted and how it has been used from earliest times to the present day. Quotations, anecdotes, lively lying drawings, some done especially for this edition, make it no dry academic study but a fascinating excursion into intriguing and often little known facts. And this was written by Dorothy Hartley and uh, published 19... 64 originally uh this is this edition the revised edition is 1978 by mcdonald and Jaynes of london and she also did food in england a history of food as well uh and they mentioned ca canals there's another history uh, that you could do uh canals all over the world uh ancient and modern now no i'm gonna leave this one to the last because it's it's the most i think most interesting um also too uh, we we can get to the history of the book, and this is the Cambridge history. It's volume one of seven. I don't have all seven volumes, uh, but uh, I've been working on it. And uh, this the for, volume one is uh, circa 400 AD to 1100, so that fits in a little bit with our first period, and definitely with the second. And volume two is 1400 to 1557. And then volume, oh no, so volume two is 1100 to 1400. Volume three is 1400 to 1557. 15, uh, volume four, 1557 to 1695. Volume five, 1695 to 1830. And volume six, 1830 to 1914. And uh, at this time it was in preparation was volume seven, the 20th century. And this is typical of the Cambridge histories, where each section, like an essay, is written by a specialist in the field. Sometimes it can be dry, but uh, they are very useful as jumping off points for things uh, for more further reading in the subject, because the bibliographies are very good and they give a general outline. And this was edited by Richard Gamison and um 2012 and some of the uh uh chapter titles are so are, uh, from uh Vindolanda to doomsday the book of britain from the romans to the normans and then uh the making of books the material fabric of early books anglo-saxon scribes and scriptoria writing the insular world script in wales scotland and cornwall English vernacular script, and it just goes on. Then uh, the part two is circulation of books, and again, each of the chapters are written by other uh, 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 scholars. And then we got uh, types of books and their users or uses, uh, and then we got collections of books. So a history of books. Uh, I might dip into because I, I've been, I was starting to read this um, several years ago. And just started reading sections. So this is this might be something that I might revisit um, throughout the year. It depends. 
Um, see how I feel. <laughs> um, now we move on to some other more. A lot of this stuff is social sort of history rather than your uh, normal sort of, you know, military or, you know, historical dates. Now, here's a histor uh, history of Anglican exorcism, deliverance and demonology in church, uh, church ritual by Francis Young. It's an I.B. Taurus publication, and this was originally published in 2018, and yeah, I.B. Taurus. And it says, exorcism is more widespread in contemporary England than perhaps uh, at any other time in history. The Anglican Church is by no means the main provider of this ritual, which predominantly takes place in independent churches. However, every one of the 42 Church of England dioceses, dioceses uh, in the country now designate at least one member of its clergy to advise on casting out demons. Such deliverance ministry is, in theory, made available to all those parishioners who desire it. <laughs> so this book tells the full story of the Anglican Church's approach to demonology and the exorcist ritual since the Reformation in the 16th century. It traces the multiple ambiguities and ambivalences uh, in the Church of England around the subject of exorcism, ranging from the contested Elizabethan age when divided on the issue Archbishop Matthew Parker opposed the casting out of malevolent spirits, even as other bishops authorized the practice. So there you go, a history of exorcism in the Anglican Church. Uh, keeping on sort of that kind of thing is The Table Wrappers by Ronald Purcell. Now this is uh, a history uh, sort of of spiritualism and uh, it, well, the Table Wrappers uh, deals with all aspects of the Victorian occult, the, credi uh, the credulity of believers, certain that a uh, thing of gauze and Muslim, uh, muslin was their dead aunt, and the venom of the professional mediums who uh, subjugated... Uh, sorry. The... Uh, mediums who uh, sabotaged uh, uh, each other's uh, seances, seances, seances and still unexplained phenomena. Levitations, the f uh, fire test where mediums handled red hot coals, etc, etc, etc. Sorry, I still, um, with this long COVID, I have difficulty sometimes pronouncing words. Oops, there's my alarm. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, and this was published in 1972 by, well, this is a book club associate, so it's 1973 edition of the book club associates. Uh, it was originally published uh, Michael Joseph Limited. Now, again, here's something else that's a little bit differently. A History of the Englishman chair, Englishman's Chair by John Clogg. Now, it's exactly what it says. It's a history of uh, chairs. And this was published uh, by George Allen and Unwin, uh, 1964. And John Clogg was a well-renowned, uh, well, it says, well, okay, well, okay, let's just see here. John Clogue is a uh, is a well known is well known for his works on architecture, social history, and industrial design. He served as president of the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain, nineteen sixty to sixty four. is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London, an honorary associate of the Royal Institute of British Architects, an honorary fellow of the Society of Industrial Arts, and in nineteen fifty eight was awarded the bicentennial. Uh, gold medal of the Royal Society of Arts for his services to industrial design. So yeah, so that's exactly it. Uh, the history of the chair through uh, the English chair uh, from, uh, let's see, how far back does it go? Uh, well, it actually origins in the ancient world and the early Middle Ages. 
3,400 BC to AD 1300. That's the first chapter, so it's a short chapter. And then it goes on to different periods and styles. And uh, mentioning architectural history type, um, now we could come to Abbey's, uh, History of Abbey's by M.R. James. This is part of the Great Western Railway uh, series. There was three. There's one on castles, um, abbeys, and churches. Uh, and this one's by M.R. James, and that's M.R. James um, uh, who, who wrote the ghost stories. Uh, so and this was uh, published in 1926. So and it's exactly that, which has a nice map of all the uh, um, cathedrals, castles, and abbeys. Actually, it's it's got all all three of them in here. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, well illustrated. It's a very good read. It's very. Uh, it's just it's each it's it's like a little snippet on each church or sorry each abbey, um, and by a master writer. M.R. James. Okay, now let's move to uh, film history. Uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's something that I could do, but that'll be in the later, the last quarter of the year. But here's a couple books that sort of uh, fit in um, sort of military war type things as well. There's two. British, uh, the British Silent Cinema, Cinema and the Great War. Uh, it's a collection of essays edited by Michael Hammond and Michael Williams. Uh, this is a, a Palgrave uh, publication. And uh, let's see what uh, year was this? 2011. And yeah, it's just... Uh, uh, essays on specific films, a few of them, and in general, like Battle of the Somme was a 1916 uh, silent film, and there's an essay on it um, by, um, well, their academics and also uh, um, film accompanists, um, Neil Brand, uh, and music of uh, the Great War and in silent film. And accompanying this sort of uh, similar is the Great War in popular British cinema of the 1920s uh, uh, before Journey's End by Lawrence Na Napier. Also Paul Grief. Um, uh, 2015. And it's instead of essay. Well, they're sort of essays, but it's by one... Um, one author, and um, I think there's some reprints of, of some earlier stuff in here as well. So, and now, the piece de resistance of History of Cinema, for at least American cinema, is a set here. I'm missing one volume, but we'll just quickly go through them, I think, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, we've got, uh, it's, it's the, what's it called? The History of the American Cinema, the, and this is the emergence of uh, of cinema. Uh, this is the American Screen to nineteen oh seven by Charles uh, Mauser. This is a fabulous book. Uh, it's a little over five hundred pages, but it's really good for the history of uh, early cinema in the U.S. And this was published University of California in nineteen ninety. I wouldn't. I, I'd love to have a hardcover set of these, but that's impossible. Uh, so that's volume one. So that's exactly what it is. It's a history of cinema during that period. Then we've got uh, volume two, which is Transformation of Cinema, nineteen oh seven to nineteen fifteen. Uh, Elaine Bowser, and it's a little slimmer. And this was published in. 1994 on well, paperback, uh, 1990 uh, originally, but in paperback, 1994. Dust on the top. Uh, now we've got the uh, An Evening's Entertainment, The Age of the Silent Feature Picture, 1915 to 1928 by uh, Richard Gazarski. 
Uh, he's done a fabulous uh, biography of uh, of um, Eric von Stroheim. Uh, fabulous biography. Uh, the man you'd love to hate, I think it is. Uh, well, there he is right there. <laughs> Eric von Stroheim right on the uh, uh, frontispiece. Uh, well, the history of American cinema is that uh, Charles Harpel is the... Uh, uh, general editor, and this is University of California Press again, originally published in 1990 and first paperback 1994. And here's uh, the beginning of the talkies, the beginning of the talkies. Uh, American Cinema's Transition to Sound, 1926 to 1931. Donald Crafton. And. Um, it's exactly, I'm not going to read anything about the back because it's exactly, the, it covers the period what it says. Uh, and this was first paperback printing 1999, originally 1997, published. Um, and, oh, which volume was that? That was one, two, three, four. That was the fourth volume. The fifth volume is Grand Design, Hollywood as a Modern Business Enterprise, 1930 to 1939. Uh, Tino Balio. And again, University of California Press. Uh, first published in 1993, 1995 for the paperback. And American Cinema in the 40s called Boom the Bust by Thomas Schatz, uh, who's done a very um, fabulous uh, book uh, just about, I think, about the, uh, well, it's a sort of a history. Uh, a, a, History of Directors, I think it was. Um, oh, they don't list uh, his other books here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, genius. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, the Genius of the System, Hollywood Filmmaking in the Studio. or yeah, That's what it was. Yeah, 1996. A fabulous book. Uh, this one was originally published in 1997 and first paperback 1999. So we've got the beginnings. Well, okay, I'll... I'll recap uh, when we finish here. Um, and this is The 50s, Transforming the Cinema, 1950-59 by Peter Lev. And first published uh, 2003 uh, was the first, uh, when it was first published. And then we've got the 1960s, uh, 1960 to 69, by Paul uh, Monaco. And everybody, I think, will recognize that picture on the front. Uh, this is sort of, um, I don't like this one. This is a print-on-demand. Um, because I was, I, over the last few years, I only, I only bought originally up to 1950. But uh, I I thought I would uh, a few years ago start buying uh, the rest, and this one was a new one that was cheap, and it turns out to be a print on demand, which I think I will try to rectify that at some point because the pictures are quite poor. Uh, again, this uh, U University of California uh, published two thousand and one, and paperback two thousand and three. I don't have the 70s um, volume. That's the one I'm still missing. Uh, but this is 1980s, uh, and that's the last volume. Uh, it's a new pot of gold, Hollywood Under the Electronic Rainbow, 1980 to 1989, Stephen Price. Uh, and this was originally published in 2000. So there's nothing newer than um, sort of 1989 in this series. So there are in total one, two, three, four, seven, eight. Nine. There's ten volumes in this series. So uh, it's it's sort of unsurpassed for a general history of of American cinema, and I I love it. I've not read the 1980s. I've not read the 1960s. Uh, yet, but I, I, I go back to, I keep, I've always kept these handy. I always go back to these over and over because they're great. Uh, every one, 
Um, especially the first couple ones because I'm interested in silent film. Now, the piece de resistance, I think it is, that I'll say here for sort of social type history is a history and social influence of the potato. This is an Oxford reprint. Uh, originally was, I think, part of a dissertation um, by uh, Redcliffe and uh, Solomon. And with chapters on industrial uses by W.G. Burton. Oh, no, Cambridge, sorry, not, not Oxford. Cambridge at the University Press, 1949, reprinted 1970. And it goes right back uh, to the Andean uh, potato. So they got archaeological record, the potato in pre-Spanish Peru, the Inca period, uh, the potatoes in America and their relation to the early European varieties. Early descriptions of the potato in Europe, and it just goes all the way through. A potato in Ireland, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, uh, the period of Irish self-government. Ireland in the 19th century, the potato famine, uh, the potato in post-famine England, the potato part in the tragedy of Ireland, the, uh, the potato in Scotland, Highlands of Scotland, Lowlands of Scotland, potato in Wales, potato of Shakespeare and the Jacobeans. Uh, the 17th century, the first hundred years of the potatoes' progress in uh, in Great Britain, and that has to be a uh, a uh, pun on the Pilgrims' progress. Uh, the 18th century, the 19th century, and after relation between potato and bread consumption, the potato in Tristan uh, de Cunha, the potato in Saint and Saint Helena, the potato in Jersey, the industrial uses of the potato, the potato in wartime Britain, the implements of production. The potato in the realm of art. Uh, yeah, and then there's appendices here. And I'm sure I'm sure there's some stuff here about uh, photography as well because potato starch was used in some uh, color, uh, early color photography. Uh, so there you go. There are some possibilities at half an hour. So I do apologize for the length, but there are some possibilities to read for history. Now, I'll come back probably a little uh, later this week with another video. Um, I'm trying to sort of uh, find and, and sort of keep together the books that I hope to read uh, for my TBR for the whole year, uh, and especially for the first uh, quarter. Uh, I have most of those. Uh, I, uh, there's still one little book that I'm looking for. Uh, anyway, thank you, BookTube, and uh, enjoy reading history. See you next time.